<laughs> Joe, you're so funny. Um, that is, uh, it is true that I have loved uh, RYM for a long time. It had, it, it, it's, it is, it is not an overstatement to say that I graduated from seminary without a clear understanding of the gospel and of justification by faith alone. And it was as a youth leader bringing students to RYM that I was exposed to guys uh, like Hal Farnsworth, like Joey Stewart, um, like John Stone and Les Newsom, and, and came to an understanding of grace uh, that has changed my life forever. Um, what I hate about RYM is that they make me speak on the same circuit with Joe Nobles. I mean, that is a I mean, I, there could be nobody worse to follow. When my wife, I'm serious, when my wife thinks about marrying a godly preacher, she thinks of Joe. <laughs> He's talking about that widow that he visited in the hospital and that, that he would be with her because she's a prayer warrior. I'm thinking, is she rich and on the verge of death? <laughs> Can I cash in if I marry this woman? Um, in, in that. And it is, uh, it is, it is very intimidating. I mean, did you listen? He, Joe, told you last night that he healed his own hand. Did you hear that? <laughs> Joe Wilkinson said in the pulpit that when a part of his body is severed and reconnected to himself, it grows back. <laughs> Just by way of analogy, that in a lot of ways, 
Uh, glorification is, is the drummer of theology. It's that thing that pulses throughout all of redemptive history. There's always this hope that, as my friend Les Newsom says, one day, someday, everything will be made right. That we are going from Eden to Eden. That Jesus who went to prepare a place for us, this place indeed is going to be that place, that idea of glorification that's there. And so while everyone crowds around justification looking for autographs, what we're, what we're hoping for and longing for and waiting for is glorification. That that's, that's the thing that is coming. And it's, it's awesome and wonderful, but I think for the most part, for us, even myself as a pastor, we have no real personal connection with glorification. It's that one day, someday, it's, we, we talk about the already and the not yet, and it's the big not yet. And we just leave it hanging out there like that. But I want to tell you that it's the, it's the percussion in the back of all of Christianity. I, if you have a scripture with you, you turn to Romans chapter 8. We're going to look and I'm reading from the NIV. Um, verses 28 through 32. Talking about this idea of glorification. That one day, someday that's coming. This is what the text says. <laughs> And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those whom God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? For he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Now I chose this text very intentionally, because in this text you've got the whole band. You've got the lead guitar of justification, that we are made right by faith. The, kind of the, the bass guitar of sanctification, if you'll let the analogy be stretched a little further. And then finally that percussion, glorification, the drummer, in the background. Now, it's important, I would suggest to you, even before we unpack this, to take a little side road and, and, and see the roadies. Because whenever a band plays, there has to be pre-work done. Somebody has to come in beforehand and set the stage, as it were, in order for the rest of it to play out. Did you notice it in the text, verse 29? For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You see, a concert doesn't just happen. And I may be the only PCA minister to ever make a, uh, the, the Ordo Salutis analogous with the roadies for Weezer, but it, something has to happen before the band plays, right? And so God foreknew, he foreloved. There's a sense in which he, he made the, the backstage pass list before the band ever played the first note. And so that's why it's all beautiful and plays out. Those whom he foreknew, he chose before the foundation of the world in Christ. There is God a priori at work beforehand, before you and I ever come face to face with justification, sanctification, or glorification. God has made the list. And he has called those whom he intends to hear the music of salvation. He is drawing them to himself. Friend, before we even talk about glorification, don't miss this. He put you on the list before the foundation of the world. It is secure. It is done. The list is unchangeable, purchased with the blood of Jesus. Listen, if we weren't Presbyterian, somebody would say amen right there. Because this is, this is the, the truth of the gospel, that it's that secure, it's that safe, that heaven is so secure for the people of God that the rest of it is music. Because the roadies have set the stage. That we're on the list. We're loved by Him just like that. He has foreloved us, predestinating us in order that we be adopted. And, and you notice that as we're put on the list, what happens? As our names are on the list, we then hear our voices. In, in a sense, the Holy Spirit begins to call the list into creation. Redemptive history begins to play out. Those He predestined, He also what? He also called. And so we hear our names called from the list, and in being called, exercising faith, we are what? We are justified. 
That's our first point. The, the lead guitar of justification in a sense from, from verse 30. Those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he what? He justified. You see, when someone's called by God, God himself opens the heart of a dead, lifeless sinner and breathes the Holy Spirit into our dry bones. And we begin to worship because of what He has done. In our ears, we begin to hear the resounding riffs of salvation. We hear the music for the first time. It's been playing. We knew it was there. But having been called, we now hear it and respond. And we're justified. We're made right with God by the finished work of Christ. And see, it's important. It's so vitally important that you are sure about the chords of justification, of hearing the notes precisely. Because if you miss it, I want to tell you, You'll miss everything. The lead guitar is the lead guitar for a reason. And I want to tell you, you can graduate from seminary and never hear it. You can work in a PCA church and never hear it. You can know all the lyrics but never hear the music of justification. You can talk about it forensically. You can talk about it as adoption. But you never hear it like the Father's lullaby in your ear where he has done everything necessary to accomplish and apply your salvation. Friends, don't go, to just, don't go to glorification if you don't understand justification because you have to know what it means. My favorite passage in all of Scripture is 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us in order that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The, the double imputation that occurs for the children of God. I had some friends who knew someone who drove in NASCAR. And they, in going to the NASCAR race, they, they got what was called in that a hot pass. Now, I'm not a NASCAR fan, but I said, what does a hot pass mean? They said it was absolutely unbelievable. They said, when you got to the gate and your name was on the list, they took your regular ticket and they put this lanyard around your neck that was a hot pass. You could go in the pits, you could go in the, in the executive boxes, you could go everywhere because the driver of the car had given you essentially his access to everything. And they said we had to trade our access to the gallery for the access that only the hot pass gave us. Friends, do you understand that the reason Jesus can tell you when you pray, pray like this, our Father, is not because it's hyperbole, it's because it's true. That you have been given a hot pass to the Father. That you have access to the throne room of heaven. Unlimited access. Jesus, the, the idea of when Paul says to the Galatians, he said, so now when you cry out, you cry out, Abba, Father. Do you understand your fundamental identity is in Jesus? When Joe asked last night, he said, who are you? The first word that came to my mind was Jesus. That is who I, when the Father looks at me, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see me weak and wounded, sick and sore, unable to heal myself. He doesn't see my sin and my failures and my shortcomings and all the places that I'm so desperately insecure and so, so weak and wounded and so fearful. What he sees is Jesus. Do you understand that when he will tell you one day, well done, thy good and faithful servant, it's not because you have been so good and faithful. It's because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus. The lepers are cleansed. The blind see the lame walk and you get credit for obedience to the entirety of the law because of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is why the lead guitar of justification is there. Because if we don't know it, nothing else will be sweet. Nothing else will be real. We, we won't know the truth. The, the, the past that hangs around my neck is the access given to me by Jesus. That's the glory of justification. It's the lead guitar that's there. Now the beauty of it is what? You've been to the concert where you've seen the lead guitarist. He's out there. He's rocking out and doing that. And what happens? You've always got the guy who's the bass guitarist. And he's always real mellow, right? And he's got the bass. He's kind of got the cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And he goes, boom, boom, boom. Like that. And then all of a sudden, slowly, they come together on the stage. And they're back to back playing back and forth with one another, right? Justification, sanctification. That those two pieces always work in tandem. That my response to this glorious gospel of grace is that I would be the fragrant aroma of salvation to the world. That I participate in the redemption which God is working out those things which He is doing. That justification looks like something. 
Paul doesn't say that you're saved by works at all. He says, listen, the truth is, if you're not changed by your justification, it's not that you need to work harder. It's just that you never know what it means to be saved. You may not be his. <laughs> Y'all, the, the truth of justification changes us. We begin to respond to the music of grace, to the music of the gospel that's there. My friends told me when they went to the NASCAR thing, I was like, what was it like? They're like, it was unbelievable. They said, we could go anywhere. And I said, did you feel nervous at first, you know, kind of about what? They were like, yeah, I mean, because, you know, nobody really knows. They said, but toward the end of the race, they said, we have chest out. We're like, hot baths, hot baths. Just walking in, going anywhere they wanted. And, and I said, I said, well, that's, you know, pretty cocky of you. You know, you've got, you know, 300,000 NASCAR fans and you act like you're the man. And my friend said to me, he said, I was the man. <laughs> Right? The declaration of his identity in the credentials began to play themselves out in his life, right? So he began to act as if he was indeed who he was declared to be. That is sanctification, our response. We, we are to be to the world Christ. We are to be that picture of salvation. We've been given the credentials of the sons, so act like it. We've been adopted as daughters, so act like it. That's who we are in response to that. I remember hearing in seminary um, a, a phrase that the, the Puritans, it came out of the Reformation, this whole idea of how the law relates to Christ. And I was told in seminary this, the law sends us to Jesus to be justified, and Jesus sends us back to the law to be sanctified, right? And that's true. I believe it. Here's what I missed. I made the equation a linear equation instead of a cyclical one. I had the law send me to Jesus to be justified. Jesus then sent me to the law to be sanctified. And then I picked myself up by my bootstraps, headed in this direction, thank you very much Jesus, and marched on in my own strength, my own power, trying to be as good as I possibly could be. Listen to me. If the equation is right, if the law sends me to Jesus to be justified, and Jesus sends me to the law to be sanctified, when I'm face to face with the law again, where's the law sending? Back to Jesus. Oh, friends, if you don't understand that it's cyclical and not linear, you will live on the treadmill of fundamentalist Christianity, living in your own legalism, your own pharisaical pride, and nothing will save you short of Prozac and therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and take it from a guy who has done it. I gave my wife Jay Adams' book, Godliness Through Discipline. I highlighted, underlined, and made notes in the margins so that she could become a better Christian. And that, that is not the tandem playing of justification and sanctification. That's the bass guitar all by itself. When it's all about me, all about what I do, and have been disconnected with the credentials of Jesus. You see, you must understand the paradigm of justification and sanctification before we can even talk about glorification. Because you see, that's the place, that's the goal, that's where it's sending us always in that. We've been predestined to be conformed to the likeness of the image of His Son because we've been given the credentials of the Son. It's not so that I can try as hard as I can to be as good as I can be, it's so that I can act like who God has already declared that I am. So that I can begin to, to live out the credentials that he's imputed to me in Christ. And it's right here in talking about justification, sanctification, that we usually say, thank you, Twin Lakes, it's good to be here, good night! <laughs> and the concert ends, right? Justification, sanctification, and it's over. And somewhere on the ride home, Somebody says, remember that third song with the drum solo? Remember hearing that? Who was that drummer? And it's like, I don't know, but it was awesome. It was unbelievable. Listen to me. Glorification is the beat behind everything. It's the truth that pulses behind all of it. Predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, adopted. So that what? One day, someday, everything that is upside down will be made right side up. So that the things that are wrong will be made right forever. Glorification 
is that for God, invocation, we love justification, rightly so. We love sanctification, rightly understood in tandem with justification. But see, glorification, glorification is that thing, that place that we long for together. Look back at the text in verse 30 that's there. It says in what? And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he what? He also glorified. This truth is everywhere in Scripture. Consider the text, Philippians 3.20. But our citizenship is what? In heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there. Colossians 1.5. The faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you where? In heaven. 1 Peter 1.4, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven. But in keeping his promise, 2 Peter 3.13, we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 19, when I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven, shouting, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Do you understand that the people who were banished from the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, God has been pursuing throughout all of redemptive history for one reason, that one day, someday, we would be with Him again. One day you will be exposed and loved again. You will be naked and unashamed again. That's the point. God is redeeming a people for Himself. The reason that you and I want our students so desperately to understand justification is because we want them to stand at the gate of heaven with the credentials of Jesus so that they will be with the Father. Amen? That's the point, that we would be with him, that he would be gathering the people for himself to gather around the throne, and that there would be 10,000 times 10,000 singing the praises of the Lamb who was slain. It's the beat behind everything that was there. It's the, it's the crescendo at the end of everything. Listen to Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Paul says this. It's, it's absolutely scandalous what this text says. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Paul says, I, When I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Do you understand what Paul is saying? Paul is saying that the one day Sunday of glorification is so magnificent, so beautiful, so incomprehensible that it is of no account to compare the suffering of this life with it. The two don't belong in the same equation. See, I'm afraid we don't think about glorification enough even to think about it wrongly. Right? Paul says it's not even on the same agenda. We often think, well, this has happened, you know, and, and, and I found out that I, I've got this this test came back negative and I may have cancer, I may, I may not get the raise or I didn't get the job and it isn't working out and things aren't the way they're supposed to be. And then I say, well, but heaven, as if I'm Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz clicking my heels together, hoping one day to go home to Kansas and that might make it better. Paul says, listen, you have got it so wrong. It is that the present sufferings of this life are not even worth comparing to what that is. You can't even dream what it'll be like to be received as a son, to show up at the gate with the hot pads, to be, to be treated as if you were Jesus and loved by the Father. Like that, he said, take your, it's not, there's not an equation I can give you. Paul is saying the illustration is, there's no illustration. It's not worth it. There's no beauty even worth comparing to that in this life. See, our, our problem is, is that we haven't thought about glorification enough even to think about it wrongly. Right? It's, it's the one day, someday hope, kind of like going back to Kansas with Dorothy. Look, look at the length and breadth of Scripture and ask yourself if glorification is in the beat behind every melody. The land flowing with milk and honey promised to the Israelites to be with Yahweh, to be His people, to be a kingdom with God as our king. <clears throat> to go to the place prepared for us, sheep safe with their shepherd, the bridegroom finally in the chambers with the bride, the restoration of all things. And we miss it. And Paul says, glorification is the Bachman-Turner overdrive. You ain't seen nothing yet. 
You can't even dream. Your mind, no ear has heard, no eye has seen what God has prepared. Friend, let me ask you, is your hope there? Or is your hope set in this life, in this earth, that this is the place where the wrongs are made right? You see, when we get that backwards, we begin to find the greatest discomfort, the greatest anxiety, the greatest emptiness in the midst of it. And it's only when we know one day, someday, in that place, already secured by the credentials of Jesus, is secured for us. Do you know how many weeks I've had like the week Joe had? They are so painful. And you know what we hate about it the most? It exposes the idolatry in our hearts that we have asked this life to be what God never promised it to be. We have asked this life to be the place where the committee meeting always works out. Where they finally get the vision. Where they finally understand, they finally support you. Nobody stabs you in the back. Nobody betrays you. Nobody hurts you. They finally listen. You're finally esteemed. You're finally loved. You're finally appreciated. Friend, if you are asking this life to be that, you are in the wrong concert. Because what is promised to you and I is that one day, someday, because of the credentials of Jesus, everything that's upside down will be made right side up. In glory, not in this life. Tomorrow we're going to talk about glorification as the antidote to perfectionism. If you're type A and controlling, you'll want to skip tomorrow. It will be so painful that we'll need buckets to puke in next to the seats. Because for a type A control freak like me, I hate the thought that there is a place, not this one, where everything is right. And that all of my strivings and all of my longings and all of my control and all of my anxiety and all of my frustration is really just me worshiping at the altar of me making this life what it was never promised to be. You see, glorification, glorification is the place where God makes all the wrongs right. I want to suggest to you that this forgotten ification is, is the beat behind everything. It's why the martyrs could face death with hymns on their lips. It's why Martin Luther would never recant. It's why Christians throughout the ages have entered cities and homes where epidemics were taking lives and Christians went headlong into it. Because this earth is not our home. It's why mothers can cry and sing at the funerals of their children. Do you understand that? That's what glorification is. It's the banquet that every banquet seeks to be. The feast that eclipses all of them. And the restoration of creation and the undoing of the fall. Whenever I do a wedding, I always tell people at the rehearsal dinner, I tell them, this is the first of two rehearsals. And they say, well, we don't have another rehearsal. I say, yes, you do. It's tomorrow at the wedding. Because that is just a picture of the wedding to come. Because one day, someday, the spotless bride will be handed off by the Father to the Son who purchased her with the bride price of his life. Where's your hope set? Where's the mindset? That's the question. Glorification tells us that creation has been groaning until that time when the sons of God are going to be revealed. It's right here where a good preacher is supposed to make application for the group. Um, I'm supposed to take this right here and connect the dot for you and say, now, this truth of glorification, how does it apply um, to your students as you teach? Um, and I'm going to do that first, and then I want to talk to you. And the first part of it I'd say is this. Have you made the lofty, the lofty truths of glorification what your heart longs for for your students, or are you simply trying to produce kids who graduate from high school, who haven't lost their virginity, who don't get drunk on Friday night, and who are pretty good kids who are four to five point calmness? You see, we've so often reduced the goal and the longing of our hearts for our students that as long as they're virgins and they don't get drunk on a fairly regular basis and their parents don't give us a lot of grief, then we are successful. Do your students long for a place where everything is right? Not just where it's better. Not just where it doesn't hurt quite so much. Now, listen, I'd rather take your entire youth group and have them lose their virginity in high school in horrible ways and get drunk every Friday night if they come to know the glory of Jesus that saves wretches like them and that heaven is where it's right, not in this life. 
Because I know people who have their virginity intact, who've never tasted alcohol, who've never done anything bad, never listened to anything but Christian radio, and they are on the fast track to hell because they've never heard the music of the gospel. Those things don't make us right with them. Have you dreamed deep enough that heaven would be your longing for them? That you would long for them not just to know what it would be like to be in a relationship with a guy who treats them well, to, but to be the bride of Jesus. Don't you find that temptation? You just want her to finally stop dating guys who treat her like crap? For her to know that she's beautiful, it doesn't matter what she looks like, and it's not what the scale declares about her or the mirror declares about her, and so we try in all the ways. Have, have you ever lately stopped long enough to say, maybe, maybe she needs to know in whose eyes she is actually beautiful and why? Because it's not her credentials. It's Christ. You see, that's what glorification does for us. It sets us free for something deeper and bigger and higher and more beautiful. And listen, what your, what your kids need from you is for you to long for heaven like that too. Because in doing that, often our ministry to them is simply our idolatrous way to gain the approval of the elders, the, the, the youth committee, the Christian ed committee, and their parents. And so we loom and labor in this life, hoping to hear well done from the people in our churches, instead of knowing that we will hear well done from the Father because of the Son. Amen? That is the truth. That is what is offered to you in the gospel. Listen to me, those of you who are weak and wounded, sick and sore, bruised and broken, broken by the fall, exhausted, tired, and sick of doing youth ministry. Listen to me. Well done. Well done, thy good and faithful servants. There's some of you sitting here that go, I can't even bear to hear that. Because I feel so tired, so exhausted, so beaten down, so criticized, and I just want to throw in the towel. The only reason I came here was to get away from my church for four days. Listen to me. Well done. Well done, thy good and faithful servants. And here's the good news. It's got nothing to do with you. It's because of Jesus. It's because you've been justified, loved in Him, accepted in the Beloved. And one day, someday, you will show up at the gate and you will be the bride. Let that let you rest. Let it make you love people. It's finished. It's finished. Have you longed for something more beautiful than just making it through the semester? To be the bride of Jesus knowing that he rejoices over you with singing. You see, what I long for really, truly, is I long for the day that my longings will be right. That's the thing I want more than anything in heaven. I don't know what it would be like to get out of bed and not desire to sin. And then when I realize I'm not desiring to sin, I get proud that I'm not desiring to sin. And then when I catch myself being proud that I'm not desiring to desire, then I go, oh Lord, you notice I caught myself when I was proud that I was not desiring to desire sin. I'm like, who will deliver me from this body of death? And I'm like, that was good. That was a Bible verse. You know that. <laughs> I can't get away from this. But one day, one day someday, one day someday, my longings will be right. And when God calls me his son, I won't shake my head and go, no, no, no. I'll look him in the face and go, Yes, yes, yes. Do you know that's what's coming for you? Do you, do you know there'll be a day when you won't turn your face away and say, no, no, that, that's not me. I don't deserve that. You'll go, yes, I do. Not because of me, because of the righteousness of Jesus. I'm going to tell you a beautiful story about a woman named Donna Skinner. You won't believe it. It's the most amazing thing I ever heard. She was joining the church in Basin Lewis. And so I asked her the, the membership questions that we have in the Book of Church Order about that. And Donna had, had been a Christian most of her life, but come to understand the doctrines of grace at Lanham through that. And I asked her the first question. I said, do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope saving God's mercy? And she said, no. <laughs> I'm looking at the BCO, I'm like, um, <laughs> that's the first question. Um, I didn't even know what to say. Like, I'd never, I'm so used to people just parroting back yes that I didn't, I didn't know what to say. And I said, um, Donna, I, I might need you to explain that. And she said, would you read the question again? And I said, do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure, and 
without hope, save in a sovereign mercy? And she said, absolutely not. And I said, Donna, you got to tell me what you mean, honey. And she looked at me and she said, this is what I know. She said, you told me that because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus, when the Father looks at me, he sees the Son. And she said, you benedict every Sunday that he rejoices over me with singing, that I am righteous in Christ. So if you're asking me if I will acknowledge that I'm a sinner in the sight of God, she said, I'm his daughter. Rejoiced over, loved, and accepted in Christ to be received into heaven like the bride of Jesus. I said, Donna, I want to join your church. <laughs> <laughs> she got it. And she got it so good that it became so forensically part of her that she was, she was actually living as if the credentials around her neck were true. Can you imagine that? Living as if the credentials given to us by Jesus were actually, actually true. I went to a James Taylor concert a couple of years back when he went through Memphis. And I went that night um, with one of the students in the College of Career Ministry. It's unbelievable. I love James Taylor. And it was absolutely a fabulous concert. The only thing negative about the concert was that I was there with a student. You know, I was like, what am I doing? I mean, this is, I mean, how lame could you be? And so I found out that the next night he was playing in Nashville. And so I called a buddy. I said, look, let's get our wives. I said, and we're going to just scoop them up, mystery date. We're going to drive to Nashville. It's out in the M South Amphitheater. We'll put a blanket down and see under the stars. It'll be unbelievable. So we went. And it was absolutely unreal. And everything that happened in the concert, it was, I didn't know this, but never, not strange enough to go to two concerts in a row the same night. But he played the exact same set. And so all the songs, all the little witty banter with the, with the audience, everything was exactly the same. And, and at first I was like, oh, it's exactly the same. But what happened was I began to nudge my wife and say, oh, listen, he's going to transition from this into how sweet it is. And I, D -d 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 -d, how sweet it is. And it was so great. We're dancing. I mean, fire and rain, you know, all the songs that you just know and love by James Taylor. And it was just whatever song it was, I was just kind of nudging Kim going, oh, honey, wait to. And even the little jokes, I knew everything that was there. And it was it was all I kept saying, the next one's awesome, it's awesome. Watch this, the best part's coming up. Look look at something in verse 30 with me. <clears throat> verse 30 says, Those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. I want to tell you what strikes me about that. And it's the tense of the last word. Glorified. Paul speaks about our justification, our adoption, our union with Christ in such secure terms that he talks about our glorification in past tense. He speaks about that thing which is coming one day, someday, with such a certainty. He speaks as if it has already happened. A future reality in the past tense. You know why? Because he knows what's coming next. He knows the next song. He knows the beat. He knows the rhythm, he knows the crescendo, and he knows the harmony of it. Because he has seen what has been secure. Are, are, you, are you living out of that truth? With the future reality of glorification so true that, that you're telling yourself, oh, look what's coming next. Look what's coming. This is what's next. That it really, really, really is true. I'd invite you to that as you think about glorification, to live in light of the next song, to be spending the reality of your glorification here and now so that your identity and mine is found not in us, but indeed the credentials of Christ that have been given to us. I'd suggest to you that's indeed what Paul has in mind in this text. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, Please, please, sir, uh, let us see and know and hear the next song. Father, let us see and know and hear it so clearly that, Father, as, as we look into the mirror, we nudge ourselves and say, oh, what's coming next? I love this song. Father, that we would look at our children and our spouses and we'd say, oh, don't, don't look at now, look at next. 
Father, that we would look at the students in our ministry and not look at now, but look at next. And that, Father, we would hear the truth of glorification so firmly that the, the future reality could be spoken of in the past tense. Oh God, give us that grace to not just know the lyrics, but to also hear the music of the gospel. And we do pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We'll take a 15-minute uh, break, 20-minute break.